Hey Rock Family, my name is Vince and I have the joy of overseeing our online community. I'm excited that you're joining us for week two of our Empowered series where we're learning about how the Spirit of God empowers us as modern day disciples. Last week, Pastor Travis spoke and kicked off our series about how the Spirit empowers us to be a witness for Jesus. And then this week, he's going to be preaching about how the Spirit empowers us to preach the Word. So I'm here with my online family, and I'd love to hear about a pastor or a speaker that you feel really embodies um, the communication uh, about how to preach the Word really well. Uh, I know there's tons of Celebrity pastors, we got TikTok pastors, we got maybe old school pastors mm -hmm. that you know. Who's somebody in your life that you really enjoy hearing speak about God's word? Um, my, I have, I have one. He's a friend of mine. His um, name is Nick Vujicic. He has no, yeah, no yeah, arms yeah. and no legs. Yeah. 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 Mm. Hey, sometimes when you see him speak, well, it happens to me, and I think it happens with a lot of people. You forget that he, know, he has no arms and no legs. Yeah. So I love how he can be speaking about the about God and whatever he, his message is all about. And you forget, oh yeah, this guy has no arms and no legs. That's how powerful he is mm. when he speaks. Yeah. 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 Um, we have so many uh, talented like pastors here at our Rock Church uh, family. But if I'm thinking like outside, uh, one person in particular I think of is like Francis Chan. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. And not only Uncle was Frank. he like just Uncle super, Frank. yeah, was he super like uh, powerful with like his illustrations. Mm -hmm. But whenever I have like experienced him uh, preaching live, he's always just like super humble. He always has, has like yeah. this expression like, get down, <laughs> eternity, yeah. humility, part of your hands. <laughs> I, I ran into him at um, the Grand Canyon once. Yeah. Yeah. Was he preaching? Was he, he preaching in the canyon? No, he's actually doing push-ups with his child. But. Oh, he's oh, wow. <laughs> that is so... Shout out. Preaching. Hey, I saw... What's that, Francis? Uncle Francis? Francis? Push-ups. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he was filming his Right Now Media <laughs> right. latest series. No. <laughs> so. How to get stronger. I think he was, actually. Exactly. That's stronger than the way. Stronger than the way. So, but definitely, yeah. Was he's, he really? He's one that stands out. I think what's crazy is that every time they do a study of, you know, fears in America or biggest fears that people have, like public speaking is near the top. Yeah. And so knowing that the spirit gives us power to do something that most people would naturally be afraid of. Right. You know, public speaking is one thing, mm. but public speaking about Jesus in your climate, at your job, you know, in, in the cultural settings <laughs> yeah. can be, you know, ultimately terrifying. And yet we have so many great examples of people who've risked their lives and staked that, mm -hmm. um, not just for the good of their community, but for the expansion of the kingdom. So. Right. Well, family, we're excited that you're joining us today. We believe that the Spirit gives us power to do things that we would not normally be able to do. So I hope that you're encouraged and excited to hear the message today. We'll see you soon.
the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. And he's a God that never fails. How many people believe that in the room? The same God that allowed David to defeat Goliath, the same God that parted the sea from Moses, is the same God that wants to rebuild his church. How many people want to be a part of that when he rebuilds his church? Look at your neighbor and say, I want the Lord to do whatever it is he's doing in this season, but I don't want him to do it without me. Just look at your neighbor and tell him that. Whatever the Lord's doing, I, I don't want him to do it without me. I don't want to get left behind. I want to be a part of this right here in this moment. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Can I get an amen? The gates of hell will not prevail. Can I get an amen? Come on, shout amen. No, the gates of hell will not prevail. Sing this out. No, the gates of hell will not prevail. No, the gates of hell will not prevail. Sing that out. No, the gates of hell. Can we declare that as a family today? Come on. No, the gates of hell will not prevail. No. God from yesterday, today, and tomorrow, Lord. You don't change because you are faithful, Jesus. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness, oh Lord. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. Covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same.
Jesus, you hear your children, then you hear your children. You are the same God, you are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God, you are the same God.
I want you to sing this out. Declare this. On Christ the rock, the rock I stand. Because all of the ground is sinking sand. On Christ the rock, whatever's happening in your life. The rock I stand. All of the ground. standing back here worshiping and praying, I got a visual. Are you able to stand on the cornerstone of Christ alone and nothing else matters? Are you able to stand on the cornerstone of Christ and nothing else in the world matters? If you can do that without hesitation, I want you guys to make some noise right now for Hallelujah. Jesus in this life. Christ alone. Oh man, you guys, I want to go back into that so bad right now. Jesus. Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for continuing to move the way that only you can. Holy Spirit, may you continue to minister to our, our hearts. Prepare our hearts for what you have in store, God, as we continue to worship you and you alone. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We thank you. We adore you. The matchless, undefeated, in priceless name of Jesus. Christ alone. Come on. We got it. Christ alone. Say Christ alone. The corner Jesus. Jesus. Stone, yes, God. The weak man strong in the Savior's Take out your phone and text the letters PL to 52525. You can get some information about the church and get connected. But as we continue on our time with worship, I want you guys to check out this message from our senior pastor, Jesus. How you doing, everybody? Pastor Miles here. 
I just want to take a few minutes to share about a verse that's been on my heart lately, Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Let me break that down. You can generally tell what's important to a person or an organization by looking at their budget. Whatever you prioritize, that's where your money will go. But I think we can even expand that thought and say wherever your time is, where your resources are, where your thoughts are, that's where your hearts will be also. Essentially, what we invest into shows what is important to us and ultimately what we prioritize. And I cannot overstate this enough. The number one thing that we should prioritize as the people of God is the presence of God through prayer and worship. And that is the one thing I'm so encouraged about the people of The Rock, especially here at the City Heights campus. This campus has committed themselves to making prayer and worship a priority like nobody's business. In May of 2015, right before this campus was planted, the team made a commitment to prioritize the presence of God by gathering together to pray every Saturday morning. When the campus was finally launched, they began calling it the Hour of Power and had over 50 people a week, every week, praying in the morning on Saturday. This is a beautiful example of Matthew 6:21. This campus prioritizes prayer. That is where their time, their talents, and treasures go. So that is where their heart is. In the same way, believers should prioritize God through their finances. That is really what tithing is all about. So as we prepare to give, pray that your financial priorities match your spiritual priorities. I'm going to be coming to you every week throughout the summer from a different campus. As I said last week, finances are usually down in the summer, so we're making an additional effort to invest in your understanding of giving. So as we prepare to give, text the word GIVE to 52525. That's GIVE to 52525. I want to pray that as you give today, you give with a mindset that this is a priority in your heart. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you for giving us the resources to give. Thank you for giving us the resources to show our trust and love for you and our faith in you. And I pray as people give now that they would give as though this act of worship is a, of highest priority in their heart and that you would bless them accordingly. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you Just giving, just may you, may you just give out of the overflow of your heart, amen. There are giving boxes at the exits and all around the room, but however you give, may you just give with a cheerful heart. Father, we thank you so much for blessing this house. May you overflow our cups, God, with your provision and your favor in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen, amen. amen. Enjoy the message, family. While the disciples of Jesus were still talking about Jesus' resurrection, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. He told them that they were his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. But for now, they were to stay in that city until they received power from the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that came to rest on each of them. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God poured out his spirit on all people. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God has raised Jesus to life. Jesus received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured him out on us. The crowds were told to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. They devoted themselves to teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. 
a great persecution had broken out against the church in Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. But they continued preaching the word wherever they went. The Holy Spirit fell upon the Gentiles. The gospel was bearing fruit and growing throughout the world. Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. The name of Jesus spread north, south, east, and west. The Age of Discovery brought Christianity to the Americas. Today, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit reaches you. Now, it's your turn. What's up, church? God bless you. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, welcome to the Rock Church. God bless everyone who's joining us from church anywhere and everywhere and online. Glad you're with us today. Uh, my name is Travis. I am the campus pastor here where I'm standing in Point Loma. I'm one of the pastors that helped to uh, encourage you and help you navigate on this journey with the Lord. So uh, glad you're here on this Sunday. I want to welcome all of our friends, our visitors. Let's put our hands together and welcome all of our extended friends, <laughs> visitors. Let me put that in the chat. Wherever you're watching us from, joining us from, put that in the chat. Let us know. Anybody here visiting from out of town? Anybody come from afar that came to visit us? Where are you from? Florida. Florida. That's pretty far. Florida's in the house. Good, good, good. Anybody else came from a, a drive away? Where'd you come from? Ohio. OH. IO. Okay, good, good, good. And we got one more over here. I can't see. There you go, right in the back. What'd she say? New Orleans, New Orleans, you just say it like that? New Orleans, like that? You don't even pronounce it, just New Orleans. <laughs> New Orleans, very good. How about one more? You came out of town, you're visiting, right here, yes. Wyoming, Wyoming. Wyoming. What do y'all do in Wyoming? What's, what goes down in Wyoming? <laughs> what are you known for in Wyoming? Uh, like, horses. like horses and stuff. <laughs> Western, yeah. there you go, Wyoming, okay, good, good. Uh, well, Yellowstone, that's, that's uh, are you close to Yellowstone? Yeah. Yes, very good. Jackson Hole. Jackson Hole. Okay, good deal. Glad you're here from Wyoming. Um, well, God bless you. And, and please let us know in the chat where you're joining us from, or maybe you're watching this at a different time or a later date. Let us know. We're one big family. So I'm glad you're here. I, I wanted to start the time together today um, by honoring and celebrating some of our team members. It is officially. Um, team Member Appreciation Sunday. And so you will see people walking around sporting one of these shirts because we hooked them up because they serve and they bless our house. This is the, the first official shirt printed with our new logo. By the way, did you know that we got a new logo, a new brand, right? The, the, uh, 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 the, the critics are out. I see some of you in the chat be like, I don't know. I don't know if I like the colors. I don't know if I like. Listen, it's from the Lord. Come on, somebody. It's from the Lord. For the Lord. And so if you see someone walking around with one of these shirts, uh, would you just encourage them and bless them and thank them for serving? Um, we have a guy here. His name is Tom. And he has been serving our church for many, many years. And this morning he served. He has been working, unfortunately, for like 38 days in a row without a day off. He works here in San Diego. But even though he wants to be at church, he makes the effort, even though he's got to be at work still. And so he comes at like 5.30 in the morning, and he sets up all of our, our flags, our stanchions, our, our, our road blocks, everything before he goes to work. And so he's there now, and he's going to unfortunately have to join us online later, but he wants to be in the room. But we got people like Tom all across this church. So I want to just quickly read a couple names so we can say thank you. So I want to say thank you to Sylvia and Josh Daniel from our welcome team. Come on. Thank you to Pamela Baker and our worship team. Thank you, Kennedy Vandersteel from Youth. Thank you to Nayeli Dalton from Young Adults. Carlos Gonzalez from Safety. Uh, Nelson Young on Camera One. Come on, somebody, right here on Camera One. Uh, in our kids' ministry, Norma Whitaker, thank you for serving. She's in our welcome room in the kids' area. Uh, marriage, Nando and Desiree, incredible power couple. Uh, from our setup team, Stephen Baudler. Uh, he's single, by the way. Come on, somebody. Uh, uh, life class, Monique Farrell, and then for men's ministry, Michael McNeil. Let's thank him. Let's thank him. Thank him for the service. In fact, he here's how I really want to thank him. Uh, I, I do this with, with our staff. I want to give him two claps and a Ric Flair woo, okay? So you got to stand with me here. I want to give him two claps and a Ric Flair woo. Woo! Okay, so we got to do it all at once. We're going to go two claps and a Ric Flair woo. You ready? This is for all the team members because we're going to celebrate him today. Ready? Give me two claps and a Ric Flair woo. Oh, man, that feels good. So be loved on. Be appreciated, team members. If you see somebody wearing one of these shirts, would you just give them a fist bump and thank them for serving? Amen? 
Amen. We can't do it without you. We love you. Uh, now, let's get to today. Uh, in our series, we are continuing in a series entitled Empowered. Everybody take a deep breath in. Ah, and say Empowered. Empowered. Uh, we are in week two of what will be a nine-week series, and, and last week we learned that we are empowered to be a witness, and that what God began through Jesus, he wants to continue through uh, you and me. And I gave you a little bit of backstory of the book of Acts. Acts is the fifth book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and it really stands for the acts of the apostles, or the actions, or the deeds of those early disciples the man who wrote it was a guy named Luke. He was a doctor. He wrote the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. And where Luke ends with the resurrection of Jesus coming out of the grave, Acts is part two to Luke and begins with the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And then he tells his disciples, that first early group, um, wait for the Holy Spirit. There's 120 believers by that point. Jesus spent uh, uh, roughly 40 days on earth after the resurrection, showing himself, uh, trying to tell everybody he was the risen Lord. And at that point, there was about 120 believers. That's it. And so he tells this group, I want you to wait. Don't leave here until the Holy Spirit fills you with the same power that filled me. And so there they are at Pentecost. And Pentecost is nothing to be scared about. Lean into Pentecost. Penta, five. Costi in Greek means to the 10th power. So five times 10 is 50. 50 days uh, uh, more or less after the resurrection is when the Holy Spirit comes and Jesus says, wait at Pentecost for the Holy Spirit. And this is our anchor verse for our nine weeks. Here it is, Acts 1, verse 8. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will receive, say it with me, power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And then Peter is one of the believers, one of the disciples, gets filled with the Spirit. And he, the Bible says, stands up above the rest and stands out and gives his very, very first sermon, his very first speaking engagement. This is the same Peter, if you remember before Jesus went to the cross, who, who, who didn't have enough courage to say, he was even my friend. The woman comes and goes, aren't, aren't you one of Jesus' boys? He's like, Psh, no, <laughs> Never even heard about him. No, nope, I don't know who you're talking about. And she goes, no, 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 I think you are. And he begins to curse her out. This is that same Peter. Didn't have enough courage to even say, he's my guy. After they're filled with the Spirit, Peter stands out above the rest and delivers a message to the people watching. And this is what I want to read to you. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. We'll put it up on the screen for you. It says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. This is Peter speaking. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Those who accepted the message. So what does that mean? There were some that didn't. But in Peter's first sermon, because he's got the power of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 accept the word of God. 3,000 come to Christ. The church is birthed, and it's a mega church, everybody. It's a mega church. It's huge. And this is the story of Acts. That a Holy Spirit-filled people called the church would then be empowered to go reach the known world with a message of love, with a message of hope, with a message of grace, and the story of Jesus. This is the book of Acts. Why don't you bow our heads, let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for your scriptures, thank you for your word, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that you have filled my life and filled many others. We pray by the end of our time that we would lean into a relationship with Jesus more deeply, more passionately, and that we would be filled to overflowing with your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Someone shout amen. Amen, amen. amen. Um, this Friday, two days ago, my wife and I, Vanessa, we celebrated our 10-year wedding anniversary. 10 years. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, I have something for you if it's out there. There we go. I, I got some flowers for you. I, I, I promised. Um, oh, they brought you the whole vase and everything. Okay. We, went, we just went vase and everything and awesome. Yeah. 
My wife is not a big flower person, so it's really not about the flowers. Uh, it's just so that you know that, I, that on the biggest stage I can find how much I love you, how much I appreciate you. And thank you for 14 years together, 10 years married. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for everything you mean for us. Thank you for giving me two beautiful children so I could be called a dad. It is the biggest deal. So from my heart to, to yours, I love you. God bless you. Love you, babe. Love you. 10 years. When we started dating 14 years ago, I remember one of our first dates, if you remember, uh, it wasn't our first date, but one of our first dates, I made you dinner. Okay, and, I, and it was in my apartment, and I made her like a chicken vegetable stir fry. I don't know why I picked that, but it came in a bag probably from Trader Joe's, you know what I mean? <laughs> And chicken stir fry with white rice and, and maybe some dessert, I don't remember. And it was okay. It was okay. But ever since that day, we've always loved cooking shows. We've always loved cooking shows <laughs> because we're terrible cooks and we don't get down just like that. Um, but we do like watching cooking shows. We love Bobby Flay. Anybody watch Bobby Flay? Come on, somebody. Right? Come on, Bobby Flay. He always wins. He always wins. Be Bobby Flay or Iron Chef and... And we've learned some words along the way. And so we'll just sit there on the couch just judging them like we know what we're doing. Like, oh, they didn't, they didn't put enough ganache. They didn't put enough, enough ganache in that. They, they should have they flash fried it. They just seared it too long. And we'll just say things like we know what we're talking about, but we're really just being, being uh, critical. Uh, we're not really iron chefs. We're just playing like we are. And, and unfortunately, I think that's the same story for so many Christians. We love doing church. We get the outfit on Sunday, we go get the free coffee in the lobby, we hopefully get to sing my song, listen to the message, but I don't know that everyone is living like the church. We're like doing church, but I don't know that all of us are actually living like the church. There's a big difference. And so here's my bottom line today. If you like notes, write this one down. The Holy Spirit didn't empower us so that we could do church. The Holy Spirit empowered us so that we could be the church. It's a difference. The Holy Spirit didn't empower us so that we could do church. The Holy Spirit empowered us so that we could be the church. And that's the title of my message, Empowered to Be the Church. That first church in Acts, they, they didn't just arrive and stop at salvation, all 3,000 of them that got saved because the sermon was so good. No, the very first church pursued God and they desired everything that the Holy Spirit had in store for them. And this is really where I want to anchor down on these next several verses. If you've got your Bibles and you've been in Acts, Acts chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 42 to 47 because the few things that the early church committed themselves to that I want to pull out from that and challenge us to embody those same ideals. Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42 to 47, here's what it says. They, speaking of that church, devoted themselves they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. They were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And then the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, three things stand out in this passage that help us, help me, help you become the church, to be the church that Jesus desires. Here's number one. We become the church through devotion. That's what that first church did. We become the church through devotion. We need the Holy Spirit to stay devoted to Jesus. And in verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves Maybe you highlight that in your Bible, maybe you underline it, to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The teaching, it was, it was God's word, it was his instruction. They devoted themselves to it. They devoted themselves to the fellowship. That was the, the coming togetherness. That was their community. They committed themselves to it. They were devoted. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread, they would share meals, but now sharing meals took on a, a different significance because every time they broke bread, they would remember the body of Christ. And every time they drank the juice, the fruit of the vine, they would remember the blood of Jesus. And then it says they devoted themselves to prayer. They were people devoted to prayer. Their devotion describes their level of commitment. I'm all in. That was their devotion. 
And it's hard to say that you're devoted to something if you only do it once a week. Wouldn't you agree? It's hard to say I'm devoted to something that I do once a month. Wouldn't you agree? And so I'm not bending you uh, backwards to prove that this point, but when I was um, in high school and maybe even younger, I, I would play this game um, called Around the World. Any basketball people out there? And I would play around the world, and at that time, I remember, I thought I, thought I was going to be, you know, just this, this, this baller. And I remember uh, there was a doctor when I was little, and he said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be a basketball player. That was the thing I was into at that time. And I would stay out late at night. My dad put up a basketball uh, rim and backboard above the garage. Shout out to dads that do that for their sons. And I even, I think I even spray painted like a Nike swoosh. You know, I was, I was, it was a big deal. It's a big deal. And one street ball at that time. And so I would play this game around the world. And, and you would sit there at the free throw line and you would shoot the first shot. And if you make it, you move on to the, the side shot. You with me? And I would make that shot. Then I would move over to this point and make this shot. I would come over here. And around the world, you got to go all the way around. And if you miss a shot, you got to go back and start over. That's around the world. I would play this game night after night. Day after day, and I would stay out there, it was cold, and I'm like, nope, I gotta get it, I gotta get it, I gotta get this shot. And you kinda get your routine, you know what I mean? You just spin it, just dribble, dribble, spin, ha, and get ready, right? You had the wristband, the headband, the whole thing. <laughs> but then I would make up these imaginary situations that would motivate me to keep going, to stay devoted. Because it'd be cold, and my mom's trying to call me in for dinner, or you got to go to bed, and I'm like, I just got to make this shot. And I would make up these imaginary situations to help motivate me. And I said, all right, if I make this shot, because I had made all of them, it's the last one right here. If I make this shot, no school for the rest of the year, yeah. <laughs> and I would take the shot. And sometimes it would go in, and sometimes it wouldn't. And I had to start all over again. Or I'd, I'd, I'd go, okay, I make this shot, the girl at church likes me. You know what I mean? I would just make up situations to help motivate me, and I would play this game all the time. I wrote this down. My devotion to that game was driven by my motivation. That's why I made up those scenarios. I gotta make this shot, I gotta make this shot, and I was devoted to this. I want you to hear me. If you're finding that your devotion to God isn't deep enough, then maybe you've misplaced your motivation. I'm gonna say it again, because you gotta think about it. If you're finding that your devotion to God, my prayer, his word, uh, my, my engagement in his, his people, the family of God, if you're finding your devotion to God isn't that deep, then maybe you've misplaced your motivation. Because the early believers, they received Peter's sermon. Turn your life around and follow Jesus. They just knew that Jesus is going to make my life better and Jesus is going to make me better at life. They knew that their life was at stake. Peter says, no, 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 you got to get it. Your life's at stake. They knew it. And so my question for you is, what's at stake in your life right now? What blessing or what breakthrough is at stake in your life right now that if God didn't come through, it wouldn't come to pass? And let that be your, your motivation. What's that one thing? What's that, that thing that's motivating you? Because some of you got this idea that once I get that relationship and that's motivating you, everything is going to be better. You're starting to get a little confused with how you're shaping this relationship and you're thinking, well, we're going to move in together. Are you married yet? Nah, but we're going to move in together. You know, I love her and everything. Have you told her? No. And God said, listen, if you brought me to the center of your life, and I became your main motivation. I would have that relationship for you, but I would do it in a holy way. There's other people that say, well, if I just, that this next big job, and you've made the job your motivation, and, and I just want to make the most amount of money possible, and this is driving you, and driving you, and driving you. But if God was the main motivation for your life, then you would know, listen, you're going to make a lot of money, but that's not your passion. In fact, you, you, you're going to lose all joy in this job the second you get that first, second, third paycheck. Or, or maybe it's your, your health and you've made this your, your motivating factor, but you keep eating, you keep smoking, you keep drinking. But if God was your motivation, he would tell you, listen, I want you to be healthy, but if you had me at the center of your life, then you would hear from me and, and know that I got a plan for you and I need you to be full of strength. I need you to be healthy. And maybe it's a dream. And maybe you're obsessing over this dream, but then you've kind of put the dream off. But if God was your main 
motivation, he would give you the courage to step out in faith to pursue that dream. So maybe if your devotion to God is not that deep, it could be because you've misplaced your motivation. And God is saying, everything that's good in life, the best things in your life, the greatest blessings and the greatest breakthroughs will not come to pass with a weekly commitment. They happen because of a daily devotion on my knees, in God's word, with God's people, and in God's presence. Well, that's so hard, Pastor. It's so hard. It may not be simple, but can I tell you, church, is worth it. It may not be simple, but it's worth it. And here's what Galatians says, Galatians 6, 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if what? If we don't give up. If we don't give up, don't give up. Stay devoted. Don't give up. The Holy Spirit doesn't empower us so that we can do church. So I come in and I can just get my, my prayer on and, and leave out. No, the Holy Spirit came to empower us so that we could be the church and we become the church through a deep devotion. Here's number two. We become the church through unity. We become the church through unity. And we need the Holy Spirit to come together as one. Acts 2 verse 44, it says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need every day. Every Monday? No, every day. Every Tuesday? Every day. They were together. They continued meeting together in the temple courts. That would be their gathering, their fellowship, their church. In the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were one, and they supported the church as one. And this was Jesus' prayer. In fact, we have, we have the Lord's Prayer, but he was teaching his church how to pray. But if you want to know the Lord's Prayer, Jesus' prayer, the prayer that he prayed that was from his heart, this is it in John 17, verse 21. He says, Lord, Father, I pray for them, the believers, all to be joined together as one, even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one. I pray for them to become one with us so that the world will recognize that you sent me. Now, there's a show called So You Think You Can Dance. I also hear that from my wife when I'm in the kitchen. So you think you can dance? But it's a show. And, and recently, I don't know if it hasn't been around for a while, but recently it came back and they narrowed it down to the top 24 and we're going to get it to the last 12. And they took all of these individual dancers who come from different backgrounds. Some do lyrical and some do hip hop, some do jazz, some are freestyle. That's my style, by the way, freestyle. Come on, freestyle. That's what I tell Vanessa. And they bring them together and want to get the top 24, and they say, now we're going to split the room and pair you up. To narrow it down to the top 12, we want to see how good you can dance together. So they, 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 they give them, I don't know, an hour to learn choreography, and they bring them out, and they have one couple here and one couple here, and they let them dance together. And some of them are just like, you know, they're flowing. Like, they, it looks like they've been dancing together for a long time. <laughs> then there's the couples where, where one of them looks like they're doing salsa and the other one's doing like, you know, jazz exercises or something. It's just, what's happening here? And sometimes you can identify the, the couples where one of them is clearly better than the other. Are you with me? Some partners are way better than the others. But how many know that a good partner helps make the other partner be successful? That's what a good partner does. A good partner helps the other one become successful. Can I tell you, family, that's our goal. That's our goal, to come together and help each other dance in the name of Jesus, to come together and help one another dance. That way the dance isn't all on one person. So the preacher isn't the only one preaching. So the worship leader isn't the only one singing the songs. So the, the 10 names that I read off the list aren't the only ones serving so that way the counselor's not the only one counseling and the retired people aren't the only ones giving. But if it's all one or two people, then the rest of us are just doing church. But the church in Acts was united together and every day something was going on to help them come together in Christ. They were plugged into the life of the church. And so Sunday was worship. But then Monday, my kids were in youth. And then Tuesday, I was at men's group. And then Wednesday, I'm sending text messages to my team. I'm encouraging them with a verse. And then Thursday, I, I go to the, the, the healing ministry. And Friday is my family day, but we just come together and have a meal. And thank God that he's blessed our family. And uh, Saturday's our Sabbath. And Sunday, we come back to church together. Every day, they were together. And then every day, this church was blessed. And every day, together, their lives were changed. That's why the Holy Spirit came. 
That's what he's called us to do, not just do church, but be the church. We become the church through devotion and we become the church through unity. Here's number three. We become the church through multiplication. We become the church through multiplication. We need the Holy Spirit to reach the world. In Acts 2, verse 47, it says, Praising God and enjoying the favor of all people, and the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. I want you to pay attention. This is a biblical equation. Okay, all my Bible teachers, you're going to like this one. My Bible study students, you're going to like this. Because there are, equ- there are Bible equations all throughout Scripture. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. And all your ways acknowledge him equals, and he will make your path straight. Amen. There's Bible equations all throughout Scripture. In Acts 2, I'm going to find it. I lost my place. Where am I at? Here I am. 247, it says, praising God. Number one, and enjoying the favor of all the people, devotion and unity. And then the Lord what? Added to their number daily those that were being saved. It's a Bible equation. Devotion plus unity equals multiplication. And multiplication is not just the result of being the church. It's the assignment for the church in Matthew 28, 19. Jesus is telling them, even before he goes, uh, 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 goes away, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he reminds the church that we don't just exist for the church. The church doesn't exist just for the church. The church exists for the world. That's, that's the goal, that we would go and multiply. Uh, one of my favorite days of the year, we do them all throughout the year, are baptism Sundays. And, and, and almost like clockwork, we have a round 100 to, 100 to 150 people that get baptized when we do them. We do them about four times a year. And I remember my baptism. And, and I invited friends there, friends that were from the church and friends that weren't from the church. And there were other people that were at the baptisms. And they, they invited their unchurched friends. And they invited people that were far from God. I love baptisms, not only because Jesus says to do it, but because it's one of the best ways that you and I can multiply the church. Because the world can see, listen, I'm about my father's business now. I'm not, I'm not just here doing church. I'm here to, to multiply the church. I want, I want to be the church. That's what the rock church exists for, to reach people far from God. We exist to take people from no hope to full of hope. We don't exist just to fill the seat next to you. We exist so that we can take people to heaven with you. I, I want to I end with a story, and I think it would be... Um, a perfect time, if you very carefully get out that communion cup that you had when you walked in. Do you have that with you? Would you bring that out? And if you don't have a communion cup, maybe just slip your hand up in the air and one of our, our incredible team members. Woo. Come on now. Two claps and a Ric Flair woo. They're going to bring you one. Because the Holy Spirit has empowered us with the Holy Spirit, not to do church, but so that we can be the church and we become the church through our devotion to God and we become the church through unity and we become the church through multiplication. I thought, what's the best way to wrap up our time together? And uh, in 1969, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were the pilots of, I believe, tranquility. That was the mission. And we weren't the first to get an aircraft or a space vehicle to the moon, but we were the first to send men to the moon. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin. And when they landed on the moon, NASA wanted them to have about an hour so they they can kind of reset their life. They can kind of reset and get their energy back, and I mean, that's a big deal. You're going somewhere no one's gone before, right out of a movie. It was out of this world. And so Buzz Aldrin in this hour, and he knew that he'd have an hour, was trying to think to himself, what's one of the ways that I can really commemorate this moment to make this a big deal? He thought about communion. In fact, he put a, it's called his PPK, his personal preference kit, together, a picture of it. This is Buzz Aldrin's, this lunar module PPK carried my personal belongings to Tranquility Base on Apollo 11. 
including my communion kit, signed Buzz Aldrin, Lunar Module Pilot. And so in that hour, he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take communion. And this is what he said. When asked why he did this, he was thinking to himself about all that went into it because It took about 10 years to make this mission happen, and he wanted to make sure that this moment was significant. And so over the the calm speaker down to the base, he said, I would like to request a few moments of silence. I would like to invite each person listening and wherever and whenever he may be or whomever he may be to contemplate for a moment the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in their own individual way. And then he read this scripture. Can we put this up? He read John 15, 5, and he misspelled a few things, but he says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit, for you can do nothing without me. The words of Jesus. Neil Armstrong sitting there just listening. Buzz Aldrin in this hour decided to do this. Why would he do that? Why would he in this moment history, all eyes on, take communion because of his devotion to God. See, Buzz Aldrin was a leader in his local church in Houston, and he spent time with his pastor before going up saying, hey, listen, I don't want to just come on Sunday. This is what I do with my life, and I'm a part of big things. How can I show my devotion to the Lord? How can I put an exclamation point on this moment on the moon? And they said, why don't you do communion? And said, that's what I'm going to do. And then why would he then call down on the intercom speaker and include everybody? Because it took 400,000 people over 10 years to make this mission accomplished. Unified. He was devoted. And he was remembering the unity of the people. And then why would he ask everybody everywhere to listen to the words of Jesus? And even though the message was interrupted in his mind, he believed as he called down to earth that the whole world was listening to him declare the power of the risen Lord. He was devoted. He wanted unity. And he believed in the power of multiplication that maybe somebody would hear the story of Jesus. and Maybe they'd give their life to Christ. And maybe they'd be a part of the family of God, our church. That's why the Holy Spirit came. Not so that we can do church. The Holy Spirit came at Pentecost and filled the believers so that we could be the church. And you and I become the church when we're devoted to God, on our knees in prayer, leaning into his word, filled with his spirit, worshiping with all what we have, not just Sunday, but Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday, coming back together corporately on Sunday so that we can be the church. We're devoted. But we do it together. We do it together. We don't forsake the gathering. We don't just say, oh, I'll see them next time. Or they got enough people. No, we do it together. The early church, empowered by the Spirit, came together. It can only happen because they were together. We can only do what we do every week because we're together. Because a few people said, I'm going to do it. I'm going I'm to go. I'm going to be a part of it. I'm not doing church. I'm being church. I'm empowered by the Spirit to be the church. And the Holy Spirit came and empowered us so that we can be about multiplication. You ever wonder why the moment you receive God, God didn't just take you up? Because wouldn't that be great? But God said, no, it's better that I go, the Holy Spirit stays, and that you stay for you to live as Christ. So go tell people about what I've done for you. Remember what I've done for you. Let's take communion together. Would you very carefully take the top off off your cup? Communion is for those individuals who've said, my life belongs to Jesus. And so before we go any further, I wanna give anybody that hasn't made that decision a chance to do that. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And if you need to begin that relationship with Jesus today, it starts by just admitting that you need him and believing that he died for you, inviting the Holy Spirit to fill you, and then confessing with the rest of your life, not just today, but the rest of your life, that Jesus is Lord. So I'm gonna do it a little bit different today, but if you 
want to be included in that prayer. Would you on the count of three just lift your hand up? One, two, three. Would your hand go up in the air? That's your prayer today. I'll give you a moment. You want to be included in that prayer. Just hands, hands all across the room. Good, 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 good. Jesus, thank you. We thank you that you died for us. We thank you that those watching, those joining us, wherever they are, and those in the room, we've said yes to trusting you with our life. We thank you that you died on the cross for our sins. We thank you that you want everybody to know what you've done for them. You want everybody to see the power that is in our lives by your blood. And so for those people that said yes today, they're admitting that they need you right now. They're confessing in the quiet of their heart that they have sinned and they're admitting, God, that you're the Lord of their life. So thank you. We bless them right now. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And now together, Lord, we thank you for communion. We thank you that like that first church, we will break bread together and we will not do it in vain, but we'll do it with your memory of your arms stretched across the cross and your head pressed with the crown of thorns and your perfect, blameless, sinless life that took our place. God, you did it for us, but for the joy set before you, you endured that cross. We were that joy. You loved us so much. And so right now together as a church, a family, Filled with your spirit, we remember your body that was nailed to the cross. Would you go ahead and take the bread right now and declare the power of Jesus? Very carefully, would you open up the top of your cup? Jesus, we thank you for your blood. We remember your sacrifice. It is because of your blood. By faith in you, because of your love and your grace, that we are covered. And that we can be called sons and daughters. And we can be adopted into your family because of your blood. And Father, you require payment for our sin. But Jesus paid for all of it. The things in the past, the things that nobody knows about, the things that are done today, and all the things that will be done by trusting you, by putting faith in you, by declaring the power of your blood, we are covered. So we'll never forget what you've done for us. We say thank you, we love you, and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody take the juice, remember the power of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I pray a blessing on our church today. We thank you for the book of Acts. We thank you that we're leaning in today to your word. We thank you that your spirit is available to us. In fact, right now, we just need a fresh feeling. We receive it by faith. Would you fill us fresh today at overflowing? Would you fill us with power, fill us with strength, fill us with wisdom on high? Fill us with what you want to give us so that we can carry out your mission to not just do church, but to be the church and to tell the world how much you love them, to tell the world that there's hope when they feel hopeless, to tell the world that there is light in the midst of darkest places that we've ever been or seen before. Fill us fresh today, God. Use us to be your church. We thank you and we bless you. In the mighty name of Jesus, everybody said amen. Amen and amen. Come on, let's thank the Lord of our church. Let's give him praise. Hey family, if you've made a decision for Jesus at any point of the message today, we'd love to follow up with you and connect. You can text the word SAVED to 52525 or visit sdrock.com slash SAVED. As we're just wrapping up that message and thinking about the way the Spirit transforms us, I love the image of Peter standing up in the group of the assembly, preaching God's word boldly. And just chapters before, at the end of at the end of the book of John, we see Peter denying Jesus, and now he's standing up boldly for him. And so mm -hmm. today I want to talk to you guys about the way that the Spirit transforms us. Yeah. Right. Uh, what areas have you seen in your own life where the Spirit has transformed you to either do something that you didn't mm -hmm. think you could do or to, uh, you know, feel or express something that you didn't think that you could do? So I, um, I was diagnosed with OCD um, when I was in my 11 and then I got re-diagnosed because it was, I was too young to get diagnosed by then. But when I was 17, I got diagnosed again. And my OCD is not just getting organized and everything. It's not like that. It's like the fear of something weird to happen. Mm -hmm. And so me touching 
other people or someone that I didn't know, it was a big no-no. Mm -hmm. Therapy, medication, and everything helped me, but I still had that little something. And then I started doing ministry in the streets. Mm -hmm. And I remember I took my mom with me one of those times, and it was this homeless that needed prayer for a broken foot. Mm -hmm. Asli, prior ministry in the streets would have never touched a homeless foot. But here you are, I'm kneeling on the floor. He, I, all of us are praying for this guy and I'm touching a homeless foot. And that was when my mom realized like, is he touching someone else's foot? That oh, it doesn't, wow. you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it, didn't, it didn't hit me until she made a comment about it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, the Lord healed me from that. Cause yeah, I, now I touch wow. anybody. But it was, that was a beautiful yeah. moment. And I remember it very, very clearly. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I have a similar story of healing as well. So um, when my first son was born, about six months later, they found a lump in my breast. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, were it, they were just rushing through all the appointments. You could tell the doctors were really concerned. And uh, my husband and I had just joined a marriage group, and they were surrounding us and really trying to support us because we were the first ones out of the group that like ha had a child. Well, there were some older ones as well. And so... Um, Right before my biopsy appointment, my group called me. Um, I was, my husband was at work, but they kind of just called me on um, speaker and prayed over me very intensive, intensely for um, like 30 minutes prior to walking mm -hmm. into the doctor's appointment. Mm -hmm. And um, again, this, we were super new in our walk, so yeah. prayer and all of that was still somewhat new to me. In fact, we were really nervous to pray out loud <laughs> back then. <laughs> Because I was, I was raised Catholic, and so I only yeah, knew, like, right. Hail Mary and our father. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I went in that appointment, and um, when they took the biopsy out, the, they said that the lump just disintegrated. Come on now. Oh, yay. Come on now. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Awesome. So from that moment on, man, miracles and, and just the power of prayer and surrounding one another and lifting one another up, oh. interceding, um, mm -hmm. my husband and I just, just changed our life. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> What about you, Allie? Because I've been able to see your journey just here on staff. And I remember before you became a youth pastor, you were like, there's no way I could do this. Right. I don't even like kids like that. You know, and I've just seen the way that the Spirit has shaped and shifted your heart and your desires right. to be transformed into mm -hmm. something that you did not think you could do. Yeah. Mm. I actually don't like people. So, uh, <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, you know, just listening to both of you guys' stories. I just keep thinking about my whole journey, whether mm -hmm. it's preaching, whether it's mm -hmm. going before youth, young adults, hanging out people who are 30 times my age. Mm -hmm. um, wow, that's old. I mean, that's just what it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, I just, not to be like super dramatic, but I honestly feel like my whole life has been just a seismic, like moving of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. where if yeah. you knew me prior to walking with the Lord, you would be like, how in the world are you doing what you're doing? Because you were a person who were kind of just like... Talk about it. I don't want Ooh. your prayers. I don't want to be in church. And I'm now like the first person to be like, oh my gosh, you know what he's done for me? Mm -hmm. oh, um, cool. But um, I always tell people, um, my greatest strength is not my talents, ability to speak or connect with people. I think my greatest strength is recognizing how weak I am without him. Amen. Like truly yeah. without him. Yeah. And because of that, I operate fully in him. Yeah. Because we yeah. meet so Come many people who... Um, are constantly flexing in their own gifts yeah. and it only can get so far. Yeah. And I kind of watch it. I'm like, oh yeah, you're going to go only as far as humankind can go. Mm -hmm. yeah. But for me, I'm like, I know I can't do this. And because of it, I rely on the Father. Yeah. So whenever you see me in front of the stage, I'm freaking out. Same tell girl, same. <laughs> tell you, I'm in the bathroom and yeah. backstage praying that the Lord will end the world. <laughs> and then it's time and the music Aww. is done. And I'm like, okay, God, like you didn't bring me here to fail. Mm -hmm. And I just release in the Holy Spirit. And I have like, He's undefeated record of all these times that the Holy yeah. Spirit just comes in and takes yeah. care of me. Mm -hmm. And so if I could just encourage anyone, like your biggest Aww. flex is recognizing how much you can't do without him. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that should empower you to realize you don't want to do without him. Come right. on now. That's it. Well, you don't need to hear any more from me. That was amazing coming from my sister. And I believe that God has the same thing in store for you. So if you're wrestling with that and you're like, man, I don't really know the next step to take, we'd love to get connected to you. You can email our team at online at surock.com. Myself or one of our other pastors would love to hear your story and encourage you along the way. Make sure you follow us on all of our social media channels at The Rock San Diego. And we'll see you next week. We don't want you to miss the rest of the series. God bless.